Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the host and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have problems with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West. Transmitting across the internet, this is episode 214 of Registry Matters. Again, Larry, happy Saturday night. How are you, sir? Awesome. Thanks for having me back one more time. I went down my whole roster of people to invite, and everyone said no, and then I got to you as the last resort, and so that's how you got invited back. Well, it's better to be the last resort than not to be invited back to FYP for the massive audience that we reach. That is true. We have a, we have a, I mean, we have a decent sized audience. It could certainly be better, I would say. And well, it's about 10,000 right now. That's not bad. No, that's totally not bad at all. Um, I believe, sir, that you have something that you want to share about just another general practice of, of living, I guess you could say. Indeed, I do. I became aware of a case this past week of behavior that I would not encourage a person to engage in. So it involves shooting from a motor vehicle at another motor vehicle, but we could just narrow it down to say shooting, period. But I learned last week about a person who shot from a motor vehicle in the direction of another motor vehicle, and the person was on felony supervision. So even though I don't encourage to ever shoot at a motor vehicle unless one's in a defensive posture and their their life is legitimately in danger, certainly while you're on felony probation, you shouldn't be shooting because you're not really allowed to own a weapon <laughs> in most states. So So you're going to have the compound effect of the charge of shooting at a motor vehicle and it could be being a, a charge as an attempted murder. Or, and then you're going to have the possession of a firearm by a prohibited person or felon in possession, however they title that. Then you're going to have possible federal charges on top of the state charges. So it's just not a good practice. If you're on supervision and someone is tailgating you or doing something that irritates you, a solution would be to try to exit yourself, extract yourself from that confrontation rather than firing at the other vehicle can't imagine where you come up with these ideas, Larry. Of course, everyone runs around. This is like Mad Max. Everyone has shotguns and machetes and, and machine guns in their vehicles. And if you need to get out some of that road rage, you have the tools available to you to execute your uh, road rage. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Well, apparently not. Uh, many more states are becoming open carry, and our state is one that's always been open carry since I've been here for 40 years now. So you can have open carry. And as long as you're not a felon, you don't need a per permit to carry here as long as it's in the open. And your, your car, it doesn't have to be in the open because your car is an extension of your home. But that does not entitle you to fire at people who irritate you. <laughs> Love it. Love it. That's funny. All right, then. Um, what kind of time do you get for being, I guess, is it state dependent uh, of, of a felon carrying a firearm? Absolutely. It's pretty low here. I think it's a fourth degree felony here, which is a basic sentence of 18 months. But in some states, the it would be a habitual a criminal application in most states, which I don't believe that is applicable here because it is a different type of offense. There are certain things here that we don't subject to habitual prosecution. But the shooting at the motor vehicle, if this person that I became aware of, should they be convicted of that? That's going to be serious enough, and that will qualify for habitual enhancement. So they will get the conviction for the for the for the uh, felon in possession. They will get the conviction for firing at the motor vehicle, and they'll they'll uh, they'll be enhanced under our much more lenient enhancement. But there will be additional time. It's a percentage of the of the overall sentence. But they, he'll be spending some time in in the state prison system. He'll have some time to think about his anger issues and. <laughs> Hopefully, when, when he comes out of prison the next time, he will figure out better ways to manage that anger. When we are driving, we have things that irritate us all the time. Improper lane changes, no signals. You know, people, people are going to tailgate. They, they just think somehow that gets them where they're going faster. They're going to do that. 
I mean, it's going to happen. You, you just have to learn to cope with the people driving in ways that you don't approve of. Well, on that note, can you give me a, a brief synopsis of what we'll be covering on this evening? Sure, we've got some questions. I think we've got one question from behind the walls of prison. We've yep. got some submissions from outside in the free world. We've got a, a case out of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. We've got a few stories, if we have time, news articles, I should say. And we've got a little bit of an analysis about why the ACLU does and does not do things that would make our people happier if they did. Okay. Mm. All right. That sounds great. Well, let's uh, roll things out of the gate here. And uh, Super Patron Mike, he sent me a text message uh, a little while ago. And he says, as I gathered around the family radio this last week with my family to listen to the latest Registry Matters podcast, I was shocked. Normally, the show is wholesome and family friendly. But this past week, Andy, who's clearly angry, said the words shit show several times. And he actually blanked it out. So I should be S, uh, anyway, symbol, symbol, T, show several times. That's not okay for my underage children to hear. Also, how dare Larry tell us what the outcome of recent cases are and not sugarcoat it. You should make it sound like it's a win-win for all PFRs rather than telling us the truth. The fact that you guys are clearly angry and hate your jobs is becoming more evident. I don't like bad news and you should work harder to not give me any. I think you guys should do more to help the millions of uh, Patreon members live in denial. Until you tell me what I want to hear, I will no longer support you or your show. I'm going to switch over to that other podcast about the registry as soon as I find one. And of course, I'm kidding. I love the show and I love how you guys tell us the truth. And if anyone can't take the registry information from FYP Studios, they aren't going to like it with the way the state delivers it to you. As always, FYP. Awesome. From He's, Super He's a good dude, man. Yeah. Yes, I've met him on my journey through the southeastern part of the United States. Very good. He's a good dude. He uh, he sent me a picture today. He was out helping homeless on this day, helping uh, pass out some food and other uh, necessities to them. He's a he's a really good dude. He he lives the way that I think many more people should aspire to be. I guess that would be the way to put it. And let's, uh, let's continue on. And then uh, a comment from a listener says, so here's an interesting story. About a month ago, my boss's son got in a bit of trouble. He was accused of something with an underage girl. My boss called me ASAP and said, hey, what do I do? He was flipping out. This was like day one. I said, you and your son do not talk to the police and call an attorney now. He did that. Now they dropped it. Not enough to get a case. He knows just how easy it is to get in there from here. So we're going to have a segment coming up later that we've been covering about don't talk to the police. And so did that and uh, and told the boss that. And uh, so they dropped the case. They dropped uh, moving forward with it. Well, I'm a, I'm amazed that, that they didn't talk to the police before the attorney got involved. I, that often, unfortunately, is the way it usually unfolds. That's true. I think you're right there. Talks to the police and then they can't undo the damage trying to suppress those statements is virtually impossible. Do you what do you have any idea that I'm, I'm, this is going to be a complete speculation I bet. If if everyone were to lawyer up beforehand what level of convictions and prosecutions would happen in that? You're right it would be a speculation. There would be fewer prosecutions because with just out any extensive research, we can figure out the reason why the police generally want to talk to you is because they do not have a solid enough case with what they have already. If they had a solid enough case, they would simply just come out, put the handcuffs on you and say, I don't need to ask you anything. I've got a, I've got a, a super strong case already. Have a great time in jail. The reason why the police talk to you is because they need to solidify missing gaps in the case. Obviously, if you didn't talk to the police and fill those gaps, there would be fewer convictions, but I don't know how many few. And there may be there may be still convictions, but for less serious charges because they would not be able to make the tougher charges stick without your admission. Right. 
Yeah, we have a, the segment on Don't Talk to the Police. Uh, and maybe, be, maybe the next one, I forget which one it is. It's either this one or the next one where they talk about that you may unwittingly give out information that is partially not true, and that can sink your case. Well, and it could also get you another prosecution. Most true. All right, then. Yeah. All right. Well, then uh, we'll keep moving along. This one, uh, this one I pulled up uh, scrolling through Reddit. There's a there's a very useful forum on Reddit. If if you can go there, I know that not all of our people can get there, but there's a, uh, a subreddit is what it's called. It's called Sex Offender Support, and I would strongly encourage you to, to get over there. And you can, there's, I don't know, there's 2,500 people over there, so it's a good place to be. And I read this one, and I thought it was worthwhile to bring it over here to, to cover it. It says, uh, it's been a while since I posted here. I'm in Ohio, and I was serving four years for having a relationship with a 15-year-old girl. I was accountable, and I pled guilty to exactly what I did. I spent three years in state prison and was released on judicial release and had five years of probation. With this type of release, I was under the scrutiny of the sentencing judge instead of the parole authority. I hit the streets in January of 2020, just before COVID screwed the world up. One of my conditions was no internet, period. I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. I chose to get a smartphone off the record. Larry, pay attention to that particular point. I knew it was a risk. While I didn't do anything remotely illegal or questionable with it, just having it was a violation and my PO was waiting at my door one day for a home visit. The phone was in my pocket. The judge violated me and I had to finish out the last 12 months of my sentence. It was a conscious decision and I'm not complaining about the result. I finished my time and 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 am and excuse me. I finished my time and am now on what the state calls PRC post release control. Here is the rant. My conditions of release call me to not have a camera on my phone. No problem. Camera removed. A minor inconvenience, but oh well. Another is I cannot be on social media sites where minors frequent. I asked for a list of banned sites and was told if there are pictures, you can't be on it, including LinkedIn. What the, mm, I'll, I'll skip that other word. No Zoom, no MS Teams, or Skype for job interviews? The other one, the other major one, which is a non-issue, is the unwanted search and seizure, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know, this site is likely a violation. The real issue is the fact that every time I turn around, my PO is placing more and more restrictions on me, and none of this is in writing. It culminated releasing uh, re recently with her denying me a job for which I'm perfectly qualified. It was a good paying job with a reputable company. The company knew of my status because I told them up front and they did not care. That hadn't happened to me before. Her reasoning? I would have access to a computer she couldn't monitor. I'm so pissed off. Nowhere does it say that my internet is to be monitored. I'm in the process of working with an organization, not the ACLU, to see if my rights are being violated. I just want to move on with what semblance of life I have left. This one size fits none approach doesn't work. We all know that we pay our debt but are never truly free ever again. Now they're messing up my ability to make a living. The line has been drawn somewhere. Thanks for listening. So Larry, um, if you end up on some kind of supervision and uh, you violate something like with the, having the phone that you're not allowed to have, and then when you get released again, I, I gotta think that it just seems logical that they're going to really enhance their supervision. That would be a good logical expectation. That's exactly what that would do. I would actually like to have a dialogue with this person. I read it after you provided it to me, and I would actually like to have a dialogue. I'm intrigued by the relationship with the 15-year-old. Who was the 15-year-old? What was the right. relationship? Was it, a, was it inside the home, meaning a, a family member or an extended family member? Or did he find this 15-year-old through the utilization of internet? That changes the dynamics completely in terms of reasonableness of these conditions that he's talking about. So I would like to know the answer to that. Uh, how, who was the 15-year-old? How did he come to know about the 15-year-old? And was there any internet involvement whatsoever in the commission of that offense? If, if there was, then the condition is going to be a lot tighter that's imposed on him, and the courts are going to look more favorably on the condition. If merely because it was a 15-year-old and it was inside the home or inside the circle of, of relationships and he did not use the internet, this condition could probably be successfully challenged because a blanket prohibition, it sounds like he can't have the internet. So, so that's his, his two big points I see in this are the internet restriction 
and you know, the the job declining the job again based on the answers to the questions that i just posed i would like to know about the job because it ties together the computer access depending on if he was hitting up minors on the internet and he established a relationship with one it would be far more reasonable for the probation department to have a great deal of consternation about a computer that, that they cannot monitor other than it just being one size fits all if they if they say you can't have a job with a computer we can't monitor that would be in my humble opinion too broad of a condition so this one would need some further development in terms of whether he has anything to complain about it and of course i don't know what organization he's working with i just know which organization he's not working with <laughs> i'm thinking of the i think it was last week that we talked about the case uh, from virginia i think with the guy that had the relationship and only then when they had the text messages did he get screwed into a lifetime registration so th these were high school sweethearts of some sort and that's that's the the relationship you're trying to ask about yeah i'm trying to figure out what's underlying this conviction and how the relationship came to be and if there's if there's a connection between the commission of the offense and the internet and if there is they're going to be in stronger position to tell him that he's going to have extreme restrictions but a total ban is very problematic you know the courts all over the country have told us that you just right. can't uh, allow uh, disallow someone from having any access to the internet it's become integral to to modern life it really has I will try to reach out to the person on behalf of Registry Matters and see if the individual is open to have a dialogue with you. Yeah, we might even want to have him uh, with a uh, future episode as a guest with some kind of disguise sure. so that we can talk about it. Yeah, totally. I am perfectly okay with that. Um, let's go to the written letter that came from inside prison. Um, this is from Rick. I am writing to you at this time to pose a question that others convicted of sexual wrongdoing may need an answer to. A few years ago, another prisoner informed me that if a person pleads guilty, the victim or others cannot protest this person's parole. It does say cannot. I thought they said, okay, maybe it comes in clearer later. In the state of Texas, there are many convicted of a sexual offense and many on the outside will protest this person's parole. My question is, in the state of Texas, if a person pleads guilty, can another person on the outside protest this person's parole uh, consideration? Uh, and I, I believe I'm, I'm gonna miss the, the cue for this one, Larry, but I'll do it anyway, there. <laughs> it, was, it was a little hard to read it at a part of it, so. Uh, can, can people protest? whether you're going to get paroled? Well, I'm going to I'm going to try to to dodge Texas specific because I didn't do the research. This question just arrived yesterday. Oh. So I'm going to talk in general general rules. And I can't imagine here's how I'll tell you how to figure that Texas would not not likely be any different. As a general rule, the very process of granting parole is open to public scrutiny and victims are required by statute as a general rule to be notified that a person may be released. The reason being that if a victim has a lot of anxiety about a person, that anxiety level generally goes down when they're in custody because they assume that barring an escape that they, they're not able to hurt them. When they're going to be released back into the community where that, that protection no longer exists, the, the presumption is they could hurt them. So as a general rule, there is a notification that takes place that a person may be released. In many states, beyond that, they're, they're asked if they would like to comment, and if so, here's the date of the hearing. You can sign up in states to be notified of any pending parole action on an individual. I don't know about Texas specific, but many states you can sign up for email notifications of a hearing. So it would be very surprising if a conservative state like Texas, where they tend to want to protect victims, and promote law and order, it would be very surprising to me, not impossible, but it'd be very surprising to me if Texas would have a provision that says a victim cannot be notified and have any comment about parole. That would just be the most bizarre thing I've ever heard of. I would be much more expect I would much more expect that that in Texas they would be notified if a person's going to be released from prison in advance of their mandatory out date when they've served all their time, I would expect that they would be notified and they would be given the opportunity to comment. I just don't think that that was the way it would exist in Texas. I just, I would be so shocked if it is. 
Um, God, what was my question? I was just going to ask you that just vanished out of my brain. Crap. Um, Cut. oh, it's Marcy's law. Is that, is this related to that at all? Yes. Yes. That's okay. one of the, the, that's a part of the bill of rights of people. Uh, when a person's in prison, a victim has certain rights throughout the whole process, including release from prison. And in some cases, including release from registration, which is a, quote, civil regulatory scheme, but they still have to consult victims. So just without doing any research, if anybody out there in our massive listening audience can find anything that suggests that we are speculating wrong, that Texas says a person who has pled guilty, that the victim cannot come in and comment on parole, I would really like to see that because I don't think it exists. All right. It does seem, <clears throat> we talked about something along these lines, that a victim is just i don't i don't want to really like downgrade it this low and make it impersonal but they're a piece of evidence so to speak and so now it is the case of the state against the person that is accused of a crime and they are going to bring in that individual as a piece of evidence so then why do they end up having some kind of say in how the sentencing would then go well that's part of what has evolved with the victim's advocacy effort is that that the system is so impersonal it doesn't consider them but we designed it and i say we the people who existed before you and i did who thought this through very carefully a person who's been victimized by a crime and depending on the type of crime it can be very devastating to them as an individual because people react differently to sometimes a person's house being burglarized would so devastate them, they may not be able to work for, for months. Yeah. Some of us could say, gee, I wish they hadn't done that, and they could go on with life. But society decides to make the rules in terms of making sure that there is a measured and appropriate response of a sentence, disregarding the person's desires that is very emotional. When someone does something ugly to you, you have a very, you'd be an unusual person who didn't have a very harsh reaction about that. I know I did. I got, I, I got physically assaulted one time and I wanted the person to be punished far more seriously than what they probably deserved. Sure. So, so that's but, the reason why you are not supposed to decide the punishment. You get to correct, give right. your input about how it affected you. I have no problem with, with making sure the court understands because both sides should be able the state should be able to put on evidence of how the person was adversely impacted by the criminality, and the defense should be able to put on any mitigating evidence it has. But you should not be able to demand a particular outcome. I'm, I'm thinking of like parenting advice where you should never like punish your kid when you're angry at them, because then you're going to really bring out both barrels and you should take a little while, maybe a few hours, and you should calm down and think about things more rationally. Yes, you're angry at them, but you shouldn't then execute punishment on them while you're angry at them. And that's why we would have a judge to be more tempered and rational and hear evidence and weigh both sides and see the level of character. Are you a piece of crap? Are you a decent person and you just made a mistake, et cetera, for you to then have someone impartial-ish execute your sentence? Well, I agree with you, except for when the judge's hands are tied. I mean, you're making right, the great the mandatory point. Minimums. But when you have society through the victim's advocacy tying the judges in the court's hands saying you will impose this sentence and after the victim has spoken it's very powerful when you've got when a, a sentencing and a high profile case particularly when sentencing is taking place and i don't want to pick a recent high profile case because i haven't i don't want to take sides on on these things but a high profile case puts an enormous amount of pressure on a court because the the, the market the media market in that city is watching the voters are watching if judges are elected, which they commonly are at the state court level. And this is pressure that's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be a total neutral determination of the appropriate and measured response for that behavior. And it's not that way. It's often distorted by the advocacy efforts that take place on behalf of victims. Terrible things happen to people all the time. They really do. And, and we can't minimize that. But what you would like as an outcome may not be what is a just and appropriate outcome. So therefore, sometimes we have to tell you, no, you're wrong. That is not proper for this individual. Okay. 
Are you a first-time listener of Registry Matters? Well, then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for Registry Matters through your favorite podcast app, hit the subscribe button, and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there, too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F-Y-P. I think it's probably time for us to move over to the feature segment that you you provided for us that's going to be sort of like a, a double twisted thing here that we're going to talk about two subjects that are going to get intertwined and uh, i was reading on the narsal affiliates list and uh, so i'll read a piece of this verbatim and it's related to the aclu it says i'm writing to see if you can help me with my aclu question i'm currently starting a grassroots movement in iowa to fight the injustices of the registry with the help of my other iowa narsal contact nancy with that said, I've reached out to my state's ACLU about up some upcoming legislation regarding harsher sentences for PFRs. The lady I reached out to acknowledged the current legislation would negatively affect those on the registry, but conveniently declined wanting to get involved in the 2022 legislation session regarding SO laws. I did not accept her answer and tactfully replied, challenging her decision along with making an impression of how we need to build a relationship, including sharing about the recent gains made by the state of Michigan with the help of the ACLU. So my question is, are there other states where the ACLU has been a key player in getting laws revised for registered citizens? If so, how can I find out the gains made so I can share the information with the ACLU of Iowa? There's so much information on the internet, but it's challenging to find the gains made in the different states, which is why I'm contacting the NARSAL affiliates. What do you people have to say in response to this? Well, we'll need to break it down into spoon size bites. Uh, the most crucial point to understand is that the ACLU is a business, and our advocates need to accept this very important fact. They are not funded by the government to advocate for or against anything in particular. Um, so what does this mean when you say they are a business? I mean exactly what I say. They have overhead to cover, to remain operational. They have rent staff, salaries, benefits, and all the routine expenses of running a law firm, as well as their public policy advocacy expenses. They, they often advocate in state capitals for and against legislation, and those things cost money to do. You cannot recruit volunteers that have the sufficient capacity to do litigation and legislative advocacy at the level that the ACLU does it without expenses. So they have a business operation, and that's what I mean. They are a business. Um, And before we go into how they select the areas of advocacy and their cases, can we talk about how, where do they get their money from? Sure, they are funded primarily from A, membership dues, due, uh, and donations, and attorney's fees that they are awarded as a prevailing party in civil rights litigation. So they have they have those primary sources of funds. And that would be the, the final one you said there, that would be similar to the attorney in Georgia and the Butts County case? That would be correct. Okay, I see. So you have three primary sources of revenue to stay afloat. Do PFRs generally support the ACLU? Uh, <laughs> you could hit the clip right there. Oh, well, that's where I'm supposed to hit the clip? I thought I was supposed to hit it somewhere else. Oh. Yeah. I'm shocked that we're playing the laughter track later. I'm shocked. <laughs> Generally speaking, they do not. PFRs tend to lean conservative politically, and the ACLU tends to lean more liberal, which does not appeal to the majority of PFRs. For example, the ACLU is derided by conservatives for a number of things they have litigated and their public policy choices. They have challenged the indefinite detention of foreigners at Guantanamo, remember? They have challenged the placement of nativity scenes on public property. They have challenged school-led Christian prayers. They challenged the ban on same-sex marriage. They've advocated for permitting gays to hold leadership positions in the Boy Scouts of America. 
these are not popular positions to win the support of conservatives. So therefore, since I believe from my very unscientific research that the majority of people that we encounter tend to lean conservative, this is not something they're going to gravitate to with the ACLU. They're just not. Are you saying that their positions dissuade conservatives? Are you saying that this pushes them away from supporting them? Uh, yes, I'm saying that. <laughs> but it runs much deeper than that. Uh, the ACLU uh, decides based on a number of other factors as well. Uh, an organization, since it is indeed a business, must determine how it, its decisions will impact the existing revenue streams. Right? Remember, you don't want to give up a revenue stream when you don't have an alternate res revenue stream to replace it. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the ACLU does poll its members on their priorities. In addition, it must choose litigation for it, one, believes that the likelihood of success is reasonable, and two, whether the litigation will alienate its existing support. And those are the primary driving things. It, okay, are we gonna, what's our likelihood of winning? And if we undertake this challenge, are we gonna alienate our, our existing support? And it's really that simple. But other than First Amendment challenges, the likelihood of success related to our issues has, has been very low. Now it's getting, it's getting better, but it's been very low. And in addition, the ACLU believes that their existing donors do not support the deployment of resources for such challenges as what we would like to see made. So therefore, that's why they make the decisions they make. It's a business decision for them. <laughs> I guess possibly if all of the million PFRs would to, were to donate money to their local ACLU chapter, then their analysis would change? Uh, well, it it could. They would have to know that that's where the money's coming from, and they would have to they would have to know that that's that the, that those people have different priorities. I mean, it wouldn't just magically if they got received ten thousand donations without any explanation, it wouldn't magically translate that. But when if five thousand people in the state of Georgia were members of the ACLU, and when they send out their surveys, and when they have that little box other that nobody wants you to put anything into, if you wrote in that box. And all of a sudden, they started getting hundreds of those back. They would they would have a a, a consultation in their brass executive, or what do you call it, where the brass high high people are in their executive towers. They'd say, "We're getting a lot of inquiries about this stuff from our members now." C suite is a term that's used these days. So, so yeah, that so yes, it 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 absolutely could have it, it, if if these people that that are complaining so much. If they were perceived as being a significant source of financial support for the ACLU, it could very well change them. But they don't see that at all. They see them as being absolutely of no support to them, and they see that as being detrimental to their existing supporters. As by and large, people who are members of the ACLU, and I know this from personal experience, when you start talking about stuff related to what we want to do, they all of a sudden say, well, you know, not so fast here. You know, I've got children and I don't know if I want these kind of people out in my community. And all of a sudden, the, the, that liberalism goes down quite a bit. I'll, I'll, I'll trip you up just for a second. I suppose if those million people were to also then, or instead of donate money to a NARSAL or their local affiliate or whichever organization you want to go after, then we also may be able to move mountains and not need the ACLU. That would be correct. That's what I've been saying. I would really like if we would quit feeling entitled to be supported by organizations that we despise, and we would actually support the organizations that advocate for what we try to achieve. That's where, to me, the simple solution rests. Quit complaining about what people don't do and start supporting the organizations that do do. Well, before we move on, the writer also posed this question. As I've had to do with our lawmakers, I am spoon feeding them information as to start a discussion. I want to do the same approach with the ACLU of Iowa, so they are concerned. Uh, so they are concerned to get involved, whether they want to or not. Having dodged this topic until my outreach, I believe sharing the gains made in each state might help me to get a foot in the door with the ACLU of Iowa. I'm not going to take their convenient no as an answer. But I also don't want to shoot myself in the foot as I reach out to them. Is this something anyone can help me with from the ACLU in your state providing web links, PDFs, or anything else I can forward to our ACLU? What do you have to say to that, Larry? Uh, 
just sounds like she's trying to corner them and you're not going to corner them or force them to become involved. The best strategy, not that she's asking me, but the best strategy is to dialogue with them in terms of the likelihood of success on certain challenges. For example, we will be talking about a case in Ohio that had the support of the ACLU of Ohio when the issue was First Amendment related. All PFR challenges are not likely to succeed on the merits simply because what they're doing is wrong. So you, you would want to try to say, look, as, as your business model requires you to stay in business, some of these challenges that we would like you to do are eminently winnable, and they're being won. But trying to embarrass them is not an effective strategy. But trying to win them over with a business plan that they see that might work for them is a more effective. And before, again, before we move on by, beyond that, can you tell me what the ACLU stands for? Like, can we emphasize these four, wor four words? American Civil Liberties Union. So American Civil Liberties, the Civil Liberties of Americans and First Amendment, I think is probably one of their hot buttons. So it seems like they would have been piling on the, the Butts County thing because that was a First Amendment issue. Well, we didn't pursue them too vigorously because the ACLU in Georgia is not particularly powerful. We don't hear a lot out sure. of them in terms of, of them. But they they probably would have considered it what well, we had our own plans we meaning narsal and our attorney team we had our own plans about about that but i'll tell you this if any sheriff within the three state region of the 11th circuit court now that that's a binding decision it's binding for the moment unless it's appealed and overturned but i, I will assure you this if the aclu of florida or the aclu of georgia or if the aclu of alabama if they receive an inquiry now about forced placement of signs, they will magically have a lot of receptivity to that because <laughs> they have they have a binding precedential decision that will guide any of the district court judges in those three states. And that the likelihood of them collecting attorney's fees are exponential. They hire now because we have done the heavy lifting for them. So absolutely, you would find the ACLU of any of those three states, and even maybe in other states beyond the 11th Circuit, will magically be interested now because they has, there has been litigation successful and there's a precedential decision out there. From, oh God, and, and I hope I'm not jumping too far out on a limb. Isn't there a term for when the, the, the rights are violated and, and, and a, the state or the plaintiffs are awarded for civil liberties violations or constitutional violations? I hope you can fill in the gaps. Isn't there a title of those kind of damages? Well, well, in most cases, there's not going to be any individual damages, but we, we do typically recover the fees and costs related to the litigation. But in damages, it's very difficult because most people have to show how they've been harmed, and there's no presumptive damages in terms of reputation without showing that in most states. there's In some states, there, yeah, but... there may be presumptive damages. Yeah, I'm, that's not what I meant, though. I mean, I mean, isn't there's a there's a term used for when the state violates the civil liberties and it's a constitutional challenge, and the the state the the plaintiffs are awarded not and damages wasn't the right word, but there's I I, I we don't have to dwell on this one. I just seem to remember there's a term for it, uh, like a legal term or a constitutional term or something like that when the the government pays out because civil liberties were violated. Well, like I say, we will we will collect the prevailing party attorney fees a cost, assuming that the case is not overturned by the Supreme Court or, or by a full review of the Eleventh Circuit. It's still early gotcha. yet; we don't know what they're going to do. But but those those costs will come back to us. Uh, it'll be it'll be a nice uh, compensation for the legal team. Very good. Are you ready to move on to the next segment of this piece? I am. Let's see what you have in mind. <laughs> this one's funny, though. Okay, you people put this case in here from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. This one, I don't believe it is at all registry-related, re registry but it's funny. And I'm going to preempt this, and if you don't know what FYP Studio stands for, I think this will get you really, really close. Is that fair, Larry? I think that's fair, yes. <laughs> the name is Matthew Wood versus Chad Eubanks and a huge list of other names. I've read it. I can't imagine how it's relevant to our work. I'm guessing you have some ridiculous reason for putting it in. I do indeed. It's an issue about speech and one's right to express themselves. Go ahead and read the next segment, and that'll help set it up. 
Okay, do you want me to actually say these words? Because I don't want to get uh, filtered. Well, you can use uh, judicious discretion as you see fit. <laughs> All right, I'm going to use a common word that I hear on some sci-fi shows. Um, but you'll, you'll, you'll know exactly what it is. Okay. On July 29th, 2016, Michael Wood went to the Clark County Fair wearing a shirt that said, Frack the Police. Wood explained that he wore the shirt because he has the constitutional right to do so. While Wood said he had no ill will or ill against law enforcement in general, he took issue with how some of the county's officers had treated him in the past. Specifically, he said that Sergeant Chad Eubanks had previously stopped him for a traffic infraction and said something along the lines of, I'll mess you up. He also stated that he believed the Clark County Sheriff's Office was a cesspool because so many officers who were not honorable servants had been fired. Wood also fire, filed a Freedom of Information Act request regarding a big fiasco about an affair, inter-office affair, in the department. It sounds as though he was a thorn in their side, Larry. What happened next? Well, what happened next is police officers ordered him to leave the uh, county fair and escorted him from the fairgrounds because of his shirt. And while leaving, Wood made his pleasure known through numerous coarse insults uh, levied at the police and the fairgrounds administration. The defendants then, being the police, arrested Wood for disorderly conduct. After the charge was dismissed, Wood filed his Title uh, 1983 action against the officers alleging false arrest and retaliation. And the district court granted summary judgment against him and for the police, for the defendants. Before we get into the nuances, Larry, let me read the interaction with the police. By the time officers engaged him, Wood was no longer wearing the profane shirt, and the office Blair asked if he had changed. Wood did not answer, but he asked Blair and the officers if he had committed a crime or was being de detained. Blair replied that he wanted Wood to leave, that Wood was not welcome, and that Wood needed to get off the fairgrounds. Wood agreed to leave if the $3 entrance fee was refunded. Blair gave Wood $5 and told him to keep the change and never come back. Wood replied, I have change for you, sir. But Blair refused to accept the money, telling Wood that he wouldn't take his money and didn't want him around. It gets better, though. Wood then asked Blair whether he realized that Wood was doing was a constitutionally protected activity. Blair replied, not in my home. Wood responded, not in your home. This isn't your home. This is public property. Eventually, Blair asked the officers, what do I have to say to him? and reiterated to Wood, get off my grounds. Wood responded, very well. I'll be take, talking to my attorney about this. I'm guessing that they thought he was bluffing. Well, I'm sure they did. Because <laughs> most of the time, people lack the resources to assert a constitutional challenge. Fortunately, this is a First Amendment claim, which is one that has a reasonable probability of success on the merits, which we were discussing in the earlier segment. Um... And ultimately, they arrested him, did they not? Oh, they did. Uh, be, they arrested him because he wanted to go out the back gate, the gate he'd entered, and the officers wanted him to exit through the front gate. They arrested him for defiance of their orders. I note that the defendants moved for summary judgment. Oh, that's another one of your favorite things in the world, Larry. And the magistrate judge recommended granting the motion as to all but two of Wood's claims, unlawful arrest, and First Amendment retaliation. I haven't heard of the First Amendment retaliation. The district court, the district court uh, disagreed in part, concluding that the officers were protected, protected from qualified immunity on the false arrest claim and that there was insufficient evidence of retaliation. So the court granted summary judgment to the defendants on all claims. Wood timely appealed the dismissal of his false arrest and retaliation claims. The court stated that summary judgment is proper if there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact, and the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law, and that the courts review the evidence and draw all reasonable inferences in favor of the non-moving party, opinion at page 8. They reversed the grant of summary judgment. Why did they do that? Well, because they determined that the officers are actually not entitled to qualified immunity when the constitutional right they violated was 
quote, clearly established, and that's the standard, at the time the challenge conduct occurred. And we've had a discussion about that. If, if that right is not clearly established, they still get qualified immunity. But they cited a, a case called Ashcroft versus All Kid, and that was a 2011 decision from U.S. Supreme Court. And according to the court, Wood's right to be free from arrest under these circumstances was clearly established at the time, and that's on page 15 of the opinion. So they didn't get to duck with qualified immunity. Now remember, there's a bunch of liberal do-gooders out there trying to, to throttle back qualified immunity because that's an invented thing. It's not in the Constitution. That's, that's something that's been, in, been invented. And our state just took a big step towards doing that. But in the meantime, you have to operate within the framework of the law. But this Court of Appeals said, nope, no qualified immunity. So, Remind me what qualified immunity is. It's where the officer and the department they represent, the law enforcement apparatus, cannot be held liable if they didn't know the right exists. It has to be a clearly established right. You can do crummy things, but if it's not clearly established that you're violating either a constitutional right or something that's required by law, then the officers are immune because they act in good faith. Of course, no officer would ever act in bad faith. So you no, have to have, you have you have that 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 invented thing of qualified immunity that officers get the benefit of the doubt unless they're clearly trampling an existing right that's clearly established, and that's what qualified immunity is. Wood also asserted a First Amendment retaliation claim. According to the court, in order to prevail on that claim, Wood must demonstrate three elements. One, that he engaged in constitutionally protected speech, that he suffered an adverse action likely to chill a person of ordinary firmness from continuing to engage in protected speech, and then three, that the protected speech was a substantial or motivating factor in the decision to take the adverse action. The district court granted summary judgment to the defendants after concluding that Wood had not suffered an adverse action and there was no evidence of retaliatory animus from defendants based on plaintiff's t-shirt. What did the Court of Appeals say about the lower court's analysis? <laughs> well, they said Wood, quote, that Wood used strong language to criticize the defendants, meaning the police. But one of the prerogatives of American citizenship is the right to criticize public men and measures and means not only informed and responsible criticism, but the freedom to speak foolishly and without moderation. The First Amendment recognizes wisely, we think, I'm quoting, that a certain amount of expressive disorder not only is inevitable in a society committed to individual freedom, but must itself be protected if that freedom would survive. Would speech, while coarse and con it was constitutionally pr protected, and they said we reverse the grant of summary judgment and remand the case for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. So it was a clean sweep. I wonder when you put your freedom of speech thing out there in public like that, particularly at like a, a fairground or something like that, it, it feels like you're, you can't just run around and uh, we'll, we'll go right to the bomb thing. You can't, there's, there is some sort of line and I don't know where that line is. It's like the Supreme Court says, we don't know when it's actually porn, but you know it when you see it. And I'm, this is obviously some vulgar message that parents generally around their kids they would like i don't want my kid to see that so where does the line get crossed larry from your constitutionally protected free speech from the government infringing upon it versus what is in the interest of the community itself and there's the fine line that we have to it's like justice scalia said about the second amendment about the right to to firearms it's not an unlimited right we'll have to wait and see Apparently, that in the Sixth Circuit, just using the F word is not enough, that you haven't crossed any lines. Right. Uh, yeah, I, would, I would agree it's distasteful, but, you know, you, yeah. we have the right in a free country to do distasteful things and say distasteful things. And this is one of the things where I, where I have great trepidation with my liberal friends who want to be politically correct. I yeah. have the right to say things that you do not like. Of course. I have the right to be insensitive to you. Now, you may choose not to be friends with me, but I have every right to do that. I have the right to offend you. I, I'm with you. I, I, and I, I look at it 
even in my world where I want to plaster all kinds of certain kinds of bumper stickers, but because of the area that I live in, I will not put them because I fear retaliation. And not fear, just whatever. I just don't want any, I don't want to like have myself get targeted for anything. So, so in a way, that's my, my First Amendment right being squelched because of uh, the general community. So you don't think anyone in the great peach state of Georgia would do that, do you? Oh, I totally do. If I put some of the stickers that I want to on my car, yes, I would. I, I personally believe that I would have backlash. No. <laughs> we had a segment earlier about why the ACLU seldom becomes involved with our issue. They did file an amicus brief in support of Wood in this matter. I'm guessing that you want to tie this together. Is that one of your reasons for talking about this case? Uh, yes, that's one of them for sure. The ACLU got involved with this because they determined that the probability of success on the merits was high because it was a good, clean First Amendment challenge. Just, you, you don't get much cleaner than this. We had verbatim what the shirt said. We had video, they had video of, of the interaction at the fairgrounds from the, from the body cam of how it went down. And the other reason I put this in was because it should, it should, uh, it, it's another case of the large body of case law in terms of freedom to speech, speak and even on a popular message. No person in America has an obligation to conform their speech because it's offensive. We have the right to be offensive, including to offend another one and even the police. And I think that as we, as we litigate going forward with our issue, we can continue to hang our hat on cases like this. It's not a real strong connection, but there is some connection. You can say things and the courts are likely to uphold speech because that seems to be a cherished constitutional right that has been protected quite. <laughs> Conservative and liberal courts have been reasonably good in protecting the First Amendment rights. We got that uh, that panel in Georgia was supposed to be very conservative that on in the Eleventh Circuit, and we got a good strong decision about the Halloween signs. This is a good strong decision in terms of yep, yeah, you get to offend the police. So it may be <laughs> it may be that the PFRs, as they look for strategies, it may be that this case will be helpful because it may be that they might want to establish a police officer's registry for misconduct of police. I mean, and they'd have every right to do that. I think somebody tried that a few years ago, didn't they? I was putting say, up that for... sounds way too familiar that uh, with yeah. police officers that have been shuffled around, almost like the Catholic priests have. They, they get shuffled from this department or from this uh, police station to another one in another state, and no one knows about their record. They just know that they're a police officer, and they, they must be golden if they're a police officer. Perfectly uh, pure as the wind-driven snow, as you would say. Absolutely. Well, th th this may be another uh, piece of case law that can be helpful to us as we litigate in the area of First Amendment. But that's how I tried to tie it together was this, this the ACLU does get involved. The ACLU got involved in Michigan, but they also got involved with a very well-funded Michigan School of Law clinical law program. It was not just an ACLU uh, effort standing alone. They got involved in, in the uh, case in uh, uh, Louisiana. It dealt, dealt with, again, with First Amendment issues. The ACLU does get involved in our issues, but it's only in cases where they feel like the probability of success is reasonably to reasonable or or even good. And unfortunately, our cases don't fare so well. We talk about more losses on this program than we talk about wins. Would you agree with that? I think so. I mean, it's just I would also then say that there aren't a whole lot uh, slim pickings, I guess, uh, of cases for us to even pick through. It's not like we have ten that we can pick through every week and f try and find the the good or the bad. I mean, when one shows up, we talk about it. Absolutely. When we have a win, we, we talk about it. But a lot of cases don't go so well. I mean, the case that uh, Richard Gladden from Texas took to the Supreme Court didn't go very well. Right, right. And what, and what I meant was, though, I mean, whether it's a good or a bad case, there are just that few cases that, that spring up across the, how many states did Obama say it was, 57? Uh, well, we could have we could have more uh, adverse decisions, but people would get mad because they don't want to hear they don't want to hear negative <laughs> things. But we we could actually talk about more losing cases if you'd like. Well, should I go back and and read what Super Patron Mike said about this? <laughs> he said no, don't do it. <laughs> he did not say that. He said he wants to. He appreciates hearing the good and the bad. And honestly, from my point of view, I am happy to hear about the bad because I know how 
shitty this issue is and we need to have better cases get better uh, more well developed before we bring them because maybe it would be a winning issue if it were better developed so well how many of these articles can we cover can we cover any i think we have time for at least one we're at 50 almost 54 and so i think we had you wanted to do the uh, los angeles sheriff one is that right well i can i can do that one and that that one is really for information and for for debate uh, discussion i don't know the answer to this this is where the los angeles sheriff has decided and declined to enforce a county ordinance relating to masking of county employees including sheriff's deputies he said he would lose a percentage of of the sheriff's de deputy force if he were to do that and he's just not going to enforce it well now the the answer from the county is that they're going to strip him of certain enforcement powers and i'm not sure they can do that i mean they could certainly pass ordinances that he should be obligated to enforce but to strip him of any of his constitutional powers that he has that's been granted to him by either the constitution of california or by california legislature i'm not sure they can do that so this would appear to possibly be setting up a separation powers of of, of argument between him he's a duly elected that office of the sheriff is duly elected by the people and there's certain certain powers delegated to the office of sheriff and i don't believe that the county's uh, board of supervisors can take those powers away because they find it offensive i don't believe they can do that so we shall see i see and separation of powers let's let's dig into that just for a minute that we have 47 branches of government and they uh they all operate together in collusion that's correct it's actually 49 <laughs> branches oh, oh my bad so three branches that's a three-legged stool and there is a executive, legislative, and judicial branch. And one group makes the rules and the other one enforces. And then another one judges whether they were executed appropriately. I think that's a way I could word it simply. That's correct. And this one gets nuanced because the County Board of Supervisors, they do have some powers to, to pass ordinances. But can they strip away powers that have been delegated to the office of the sheriff by the state of California Constitution or by the state of California legislature. That is the unknown unknown here in terms of the separation of powers. And I'm not sure they can do that. I'm not sure because you don't like what the sheriff refuses to do that you can strip any powers from the sheriff. Very good. Do you want to, that, that one came from, I, I all I see is MSN start, but MSN.com is where that article came from. And uh, so think we could cover one more maybe one even after that do you want to cover the one about these two child porn crimes don't require pfr registration sure in those kansas? are both out of kansas and I, I put this in here mainly because i want to illustrate if you look at article number one what does can you just read the headline of that i will as soon as it comes up um it says victims advocate lawmakers to force convicted peeping suspects onto PFR registry. So on, on Thursday, the Kansas Senate is set to hear on Tuesday. Boy, that's why you're the reader here. On Tuesday, the Kansas Senate is set to hear a PFR topic in Topeka. Kansas Senate Bill 385 would require people convicted of certain breach of privacy laws like peeping to register as a PFR. This is something victims and advocates have been fighting for af after several high-profile peeping cases in the Kansas City area. Folks, I hate to break it to you. We're not on the same side with victims. Get over it. Okay, next article. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one is uh, these two child porn crimes don't require PFR registration, which I just realized is actually the same person forced to register, register. But uh, a Kansas bill would then change that. What do you want to cover in here? Well, this is one of those where I'd, I'm even shocked that such a loophole would exist. And uh, But again, Kansas Attorney General is pushing for this. And I'm sure that Senate Bill 368 will have broad bipartisan support, but, but there are not very many Democrats in Kansas, but it's going to have to the extent there are any Democrats in Kansas and the urban areas that they're going to support this because you can't, you cannot not have people that are convicted of these serious crimes not being required to register as PFRs. So this one well, is How would we know one. where they are, Larry, if they're not on the registry? I don't know, but but uh, folks in Kansas, if you want to, if you want to push back, now's the time to push back because this proposal is apparently set to be heard Tuesday. So be there, speak up. 
do we even have any advocates in Kansas? We do, or we did. I'm pretty sure we still do, yes. I can't think of anybody. I mean, like I know people from the other states that have any level of activity. I've not heard of Kansas. But, yeah, and couple, I apologize if you exist and you're a listener to the program. Yeah, there's a couple of people over there. I don't know how active they are right now, but yes. And actually, they're pretty good people. They, they actually know quite a bit about how processes work. Oh, well, all right. Then it shows you what I know. Um, I am going to play... At the same time of going to look up who actually wrote in first, uh, this is a. Uh, we'll move on to uh, who's that speaker, Larry. I think uh, we're at uh, right shy of an hour, and I think that's uh, about where we should shut it down. Is there anything you want to say before we uh, close things out and finish up the show? Just a reminder: we're looking for testimonials to send to to place on our website. So send them to us either by electronic means or if you're a paper subscriber, send it to the same address that your transcript originates from. We appreciate that very much. Very good. All right. Well, last week, I God, I really didn't think anybody was going to get this one, but this is what I played. What would you do if you were elected about Aleppo? About Aleppo. And what is Aleppo? <laughs> You're kidding. No. Aleppo is in Syria. I, I really got a kick out of the, the TV show host. He goes, okay, tell me about Aleppo. Aleppo? Aleppo. He, like, really enunciates it very clearly, saying Aleppo. Anyway, that was, uh, I, I'll give you the uh, privileges there, Larry. Who was that? That was former New Mexico Governor Gary Puff Johnson when he was running for president. <laughs> and why was he, why was he Puff Johnson? Well, I, I make this joke about him because in his two terms as governor, when he ran for re-election for his second term, which would have been 1998, he ran on a law and order platform, which he was a member of the Republican Party. He's more of a libertarian, but the Libertarian Party didn't have the potential to elect the governor, so he ran as a Republican. And he promised law and order and to crack down on crime. And he said in his campaign commercials that they should serve every stinking day. And then shortly at, thereafter, oh. he, he had an epiphany, and he started looking at the cost of the corrections department. He started realizing that a lot of people were in prison that were serving every stinking day <laughs> for stuff that probably didn't really need to be criminalized. And his libertarian tendencies started to kick in, and he started talking about the legalization of her drugs, which I, in some aspects, agree with him on that. Not completely, but in, in some portions, I agree with him. And he, he all of a sudden, when he was no longer subject to you can only serve two terms as governor, he all of a sudden had an epiphany. Epiphanies are good. But he all of a sudden became known as, as Puff Johnson because he was advocating for, for repeal of, of drug laws, particularly marijuana. I see. All right. Well, it um, looks like the first person that wrote that one in was uh, Jonathan. So thank you very much, Jonathan. There's your 15 seconds of fame. Also, last week, we played another clip, and uh, Brian wrote in and got that one about the Postmaster General. Uh, what, what was his name? Let's play that again, because that is just such a beautiful clip. Oh, you had to ask me to do that one. Yes, I do have it. How much longer are you planning to stay? A uh, long time. Get used to me. All right, so that's you. We're get, we got to get used to you? Yeah, that's Postmaster DeJoy, and uh, that was okay. that was in response to uh, he was at a House of Representatives congressional hearing, and he was asked about uh, he was first improperly told that he was a holdover appointee, and he corrected that he was not a holdover appointee; he was appointed by a bipartisan commission. And then the member proceeded to ask him, "Well, how long do you plan to stay?" And that that's where that's where that comes from. I see. So we have to get used to you, which means we all need a lot more. Um chilling us out beverages that's correct get get used to me <laughs> all right so this week um now look i i personally believe that this one is super recognizable because i remember when this happened and uh so i i modified the voice a little bit larry couldn't hear it the first way i did it so i modified it again and so i hope you can hear it clearly i'll play it twice but uh you get to tell me who this is all right there are 47 percent of women who are dependent on government who believe that, that they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement. And the government should give it to them. 
And again, the audio is really shitty because there's it, somebody had a phone camera on a table and it was a covert recording being done. And uh, so there's some noise in the background. Even in like the video, you can see like a waiter uh, or a busboy or somebody moving past the screen. I will play it again and listen carefully. All right, there are 27% who are dependent on government. We believe that they are victims. We believe the government has a responsibility to care for them. We believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's, that's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. It's funny to me, Larry, like, as far as audio goes, like, the first time, it takes you a minute to, like, get the car to get into gear, and then maybe the second or third time, you're like, oh, yeah, that's what I actually hear him saying. You have to, like, get yourself ready and used to listening to it before you can hear the words and so forth. Any ideas? I have, I have no idea, so I'm stumped. All right. Um, okay. Well, I think uh, we are about ready to close it all down, sir. Is there anything? Uh, let's see. Do you want to tell me something really quick? You got like 30 seconds. Tell me really quick about an article you sent me about the economy. What are you talking about? The budget deficit? That's the one. Yeah. Well, the budget deficit for the first four months of the fiscal year that, we, that we're in starting October 1st is down precipitously. We ran a $163 billion surplus in January. So as Surplus typical, means like putting money in the bank. Right. Yeah, it means we collected more in federal revenue than we expended in the month of January. First time that's happened in a long time where we've had a monthly surplus. Doesn't happen very often. It normally happens in tax collection months like April. But the okay. deficit for the first four months of the fiscal year is down dramatically, folks. And uh, I'm. <laughs> um, someone says, "Wrap it up, Larry." DQ cannot wait. Um. The other, is it possible that you're reading into this like with some sort of filters on that there's other conditions? Is it because of like the job market? Like there are 475,000 jobs last month or something like that? I mean, is it related to that? Well, it's related to the robust recovery we've had in the economy, which is about to stall. Uh, but but we've, had a, we've had a robust economy for the last uh, uh, year, year and a half. The, the recovery started under President Trump. But, you know, when we hit 15 percent unemployment in the early stage of the pandemic, there was sure. a robust recovery taking place in the latter part of the Trump term. But it's it's continued. And despite all the naysayers, it has continued. And the so we've got 11 million unfilled jobs. We've got tax revenue coming in at unexpected levels. And we have a, a labor shortage that is going to continue, continue to to get worse, I think, because of the the. Uh, we just don't have the the demographics of the country are just not good, and so we're going to continue to have a shrinking labor pool, and the economy will eventually stall because we have too many dollars competing for production that's just simply not there. We don't have the ability to do things with a shortage of workers. You can't build houses, you can't build office buildings, you can't build apartments, you can't run factories, you can't run restaurants, you can't run truck lines, you can't do all these things if you don't have workers, folks. Very true. Yeah, uh, all the, the the supply shortage issue, the supply chain issue, that is amazing on what a little 50 cent chip is hold, holding, halting production on factory floors. I, I find that to be fascinating that you can have a, a factory in Taiwan that's producing chips and they can't produce them fast enough or they have shut down from COVID. And that is making a $40,000 truck on a Ford assembly line just sit there waiting for an ABS sensor or something like that. So well, well, the the long longer term range, uh, longer range, this is isn't good because the economy will stall. It's like an airplane that can't get lift. The economy, when it, you don't have workers, you will eventually stall because you can't produce, and that's where we are. We cannot continue to expand production either. We have to do automation, which some jobs just don't automate well, or production just lags because we can't meet demand. Um, I did want to say one. Th thing a, a, a comment came across in chat i gotta find it um so one of our long 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 time listeners he said burying our heads in the sand is partially how things got to where they currently are knowing the bad helps to improve our angle of argument i think that's awesome so we we, we need to cover more defeats too larry absolutely all right all right well, that is all we have for the program tonight, Larry. Um, you can find all of the show notes and everything that you want to find over at registrymatters.co. Uh, Leave us voicemail, 747-227-4477.
registrymatterscast at gmail.com. Registrymatterscast at gmail.com. Oh, for the uh, Who's That Speaker thing, send, send that email to there and tell me who's that speaker in the subject line. And then, of course, you can support us over at patreon.com slash registrymatters, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And then also I'll plug the FYP education site uh, to find uh, printed transcripts that you can uh, send into your loved ones in prison. And I'll let you finish up that whole thought on the FYP site. Awesome. You can also find the summaries of state statutes requ requiring various things for PFRs. And hopefully we will expand that inventory as we figure out how to do it, what we can feasibly place on the FYP education website. Hopefully there'll be some listing of court decisions. Right now you have to go through the transcript to try to find them, but we're hoping to make that simpler for folks. So the FYP education website is going to get better and better over time. Very good. Well, that is all I have, Mr. Larry, and I hope you have a splendid rest of your weekend, and I will uh, I'll talk to you very soon. Have a great night, my friend. Good night. You've been listening to FYP.